Hi, I'm Steve Schindler. I'm Katie Wilson Milney. Welcome to the Art Law Podcast, a monthly podcast exploring the places where art intersects with and interferes with the law. The Art Law Podcast is sponsored by the law firm of Schindler, Cohen, and Hockman, LLP, a premier litigation and art law boutique in New York City. Hi, Steve. Hi, Katie. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm feeling healthy, and um, I'm feeling excited to talk about import regulations. Well, it's. I'm, I'm glad that you're back. It's <laughs> nice to have you in the studio, and who better to talk about import regulations than an art lawyer who we've wanted to have on the podcast now for some time, uh, Pierre Valentin. And Pierre Valentin has over 25 years of experience advising clients within the art law space. His practice focuses on contentious and non-contentious matters of ownership. That's a very British type of uh, thing. It's either disputes or transactions. Love that. Valuation of art, fraud, authenticity, and provenance, foreign nation recoveries, intellectual property, and new technologies. He has a wealth of experience in handling all aspects of complex international transactions and is well known for his experience in art finance. He's been praised by commentators as, quote, one of the best exponents of art law in the business, unquote, and has been called, quote, a veritable giant in the field by Spears 500. And it's a pleasure to welcome Pierre to the podcast. Yes, welcome, Pierre. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Katie. So I, I think we should set the scene a little better, Steve, which is that <laughs> this is a sexier topic than we made it, make it sound. I mean, as our Go listeners know, art is moving all over the world all the time, right? It's moving in and out of the big art cities, New York, London, Hong Kong, Paris to some extent, you know, the big cities that we think of. So there's a constant movement of the most valuable art. We've also talked on the podcast about the deep, long, difficult problems with cultural property, both in terms of understanding the origins of cultural property, who owns items of cultural property now, and how on earth courts and governments are supposed to adjudicate these disputes in the absence of provenance documentation, and even scholarly consensus about a lot of these objects. So these really hard, interesting topics do all come together in how countries deal with the import and export of fine art. And countries have different ways of dealing with that. In the United States, you know, we have customs and border patrol, and part of what they do is deal with the import and export of goods, including fine art, and that's true all over the world as well. And so We haven't spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about how those import-export regulations impact these other issues of stolen art and cultural property, but they obviously do because countries do not generally want stolen property or otherwise illegally obtained property coming in and out of their borders. It's bad PR. It's bad in terms of their relationships with other countries. And so this is actually a really important issue. And what's bringing us to talk about it today is that the EU is implementing new regulations of a strictness and scale that we have not seen before um, in terms of the restrictions on importing cultural goods, which include art and cultural property. So that's what we have. That is a very sexy topic. I agree (laughs) with you. I feel excited to talk about it. All right. We're excited. So Pierre, maybe you can just set the stage as we're starting uh, by just explaining in a kind of a broad sense uh, what is new in the U- EU, what regulations are soon to go in effect that will have this broad impact that Katie suggested. Right. So maybe a little bit of a historical context would be useful. It's really since the early 1900s that countries in Europe and around the Mediterranean Um, have started introducing controls over the export of art from their country. Now, I think it's fair to say that for the first 50 to 70 years, there were rules on the statute books, rules that control or restrict the export of art. 
but their implementation or their application, I would say, was quite lax. And I certainly remember, you know, when I started in the art world in the mid 1990s, you know, we knew that there were export control rules out of Egypt, Italy, Spain, etc. But quite frankly, well, you know, certainly the market didn't pay a great deal of attention to that. When we're talking about these export rules, are you talking about export regulations uh, in the sense of licensing requirements and also so-called patrimony laws, you know, that we have, say, in Egypt or in Turkey, which basically claim for that country ownership in, in certain kinds of cultural property? Are these both under the umbrella of export regulations that you're referring to? This is a very important point, and, and the answer is no. To my mind, there are uh, rules that determine who is the owner of a particular artwork, and you refer to patrimony laws that basically vest ownership of certain goods in the state. So, for example, um, objects that are excavated from underground or that are found under in the sea, ownership of those goods in many countries will rest with the state. Um, things that are created, um, for example, by artists, well, they will vest in the artists in the first instance and then in whoever who, who buys them from the artist. So that's really about ownership. What I'm talking about is different, something different. It's the rules that control the removal of art and other objects from a particular country. And, and that's nothing to do, generally speaking, with ownership. It's to do with whether the state controls uh, what leaves the country and potentially has a claim for the return of what left illegally. But there is some overlap, right, Pierre? I mean, that's a really important distinction. But to some degree, some of these export rules exist because of concerns, not just to collect maybe export duties, right, but to either keep track of or control or monitor questions of ownership with respect to what we'll call cultural property, which doesn't even need to be ancient property, but might just be property that, you know, a state decides is valuable to its own history and it wants to either figure out a way to keep it in the country, even if it's not owned by the state, or, you know, at least make sure that there are no ownership questions. I mean, would you agree that there's some connection? Well, as a lawyer, I'm not sure I, I see that overlap. There is one exception, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, to my mind, what's owned by the state, well, the state decides what, what to do with it. And generally, if it's owned by the state, it can't leave the country. Right. Um, what's owned by private individuals in the absence of export controls, technically, there's no reason why those things cannot leave the country. But as a matter of policy, countries, probably starting from the beginning of the 20th century, decided that they ought to regulate um, what left the country, what was in private hands and left the country, especially source countries like Italy, um, Turkey, Greece, Egypt, etc. And those rules are there to regulate what private individuals can remove from the country and what they can't. Right. And then on top of that, uh, some countries have listing systems where they list items in private hands as cultural patrimony or national patrimony, and certainly those things can't leave the country. Right. And the difference um, between some of those are like you could have, uh, say, a Monet painting in France that's very important historically. It could be privately owned, but if someone wants to export it out of France, it has to be approved by the French government, and they have the right normally to buy it and to keep it. Because and of its cultural because importance. Of it, but, it, but the difference is they, they're not asserting ownership. They would have to buy it in order to own it, whereas in other countries, uh, you know, for example, the patrimony laws that you've referred to in Egypt or Turkey, anything that comes out of the ground after a particular date is claimed to be owned by that country. Yes, and there's a third category, for example, in Italy, 
you can own an important painting uh, as a private individual. That painting is considered national patrimony, but unlike France, Italy doesn't have to buy it. So there are many important old families in Italy that have hanging on the walls paintings, for example, that belong to them, but are listed as national treasures and are subject to quite extensive restrictions. They can't be moved without the state's consent, they can't be loaned, they can't be restored, and they certainly can't leave the country without the state's concern, yet they remain private property. Right. So there's really, there's quite a large spectrum of motivations for for controlling exports among countries. Some is just to collect duty, to keep records, and some is really focused on these national treasures. Um, Okay, so to get back on track, so (laughs) that was very helpful background. So yes, of course, there are export restrictions around the world. What was sort of the status quo? What, What has been the system in the EU Uh, and we'll say distinct from the UK and certainly the US, which we'll maybe briefly mention, what has been the status quo in the EU in terms of importing objects of cultural significance? Okay, so until now, uh, if you want to import an object of cultural significance in an EU country, it's relatively straightforward. You declare it at customs in the country of import, and you pay what we call import VAT. There's no duty or excise on artworks. They are uh, exempt, but import VAT does apply. So you have to declare the value at import and uh, VAT will be levied at the rate applicable in the country of import. In Europe, uh, for now, uh, the UK has the lowest rate at at 5% of the import value. I think the highest rate is in Hungary at 27%. Each country applies its own rate. But as I say, it's relatively straightforward. That's about to change with the introduction of this new EU regulation. Right. So the VAT or the VAT for our listeners is sort of analogous to a federal sales tax. If we don't have that system in the U.S., we don't have a a federal sort of VAT or import tax. But the closest analogy would be what we call a use tax in every state in which an object was imported. And that's just a state sort of sales and use tax issue. Um, Okay, so that seems fairly analogous to what we have here minus the the VAT. So you could just show up in Paris, you could bring something with you on the plane, you could have your sister send it to you, you could have your art dealer send it to you, and you wouldn't have to do anything in advance. You just have to sort of fill out paperwork on arrival pay whatever you owe, and, and that's it. Yeah. Okay. And that doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, an ancient relic from Cyprus or whether it's, uh, you know, a modern a modernist painting. It makes no difference. That's right. Now, there are special rules for certain countries that are at war. Um, yeah. And right now uh, in the EU, and there are special rules, well, there have been special rules applying to cultural goods coming from Iraq. And since 2014, there have been special rules applying to cultural property coming from Syria. The reason for those special rules is because those countries have been areas of conflict, very serious conflict, and uh, the EU decided that um, cultural property coming from those countries were more likely to have been looted and therefore their importation should not be allowed unless very strict conditions are met. Right. And I, I, we should just say briefly, I mean, we're not going to focus on the U.S., but I think the U.S. counter example is pretty simple, as we've alluded to. Right, Steve? I mean, we don't have special rules about importing fine art or cultural objects unless there's sort of an ownership issue either because we have an agreement with a source country or it's a stolen property or right. I mean, I think illegal. the distinction has always been that the U.S. generally doesn't enforce or apply the export regulations of the type that we talked about in France and Italy yeah. to imports here. It does, of course, prohibit uh, the importation of stolen property, which would be property that was stolen either physically in the normal sense or because it uh, is deemed stolen. It's deemed owned by a sovereign nation and and we respect that nation's laws. So that's that's been the distinction. The other thing is you still, even though 
there's no import duty on art per se, you still, if you're bringing art into the country, have to fill out customs forms, et cetera, yeah. and you can't lie on those forms. Right. And some people have gotten into trouble sometimes by making false statements, either about the provenance or the value of the works, you know, and, and it turns out that they're they're not correct, and that's also problematic. I feel like this is a theme on our podcast. Even when there's no law or regulation, you still can't do something else illegal, right? You can't exactly. commit fraud. No, exactly. And that's, you can't possess stolen property. Right. So that's, the, yeah, that's, that's a good rule. That's better. Uh, Pierre, really quick, what is the status in the UK? Because that is not changing under these new regulations, correct, given that Brexit occurred. That's right. So the um, EU regulation that uh, we're going to talk about did form part of English law because of the dates when the regulation was introduced. However, um, it was subsequently revoked by the United Kingdom. Accordingly, it won't apply in the UK. The rules in the UK are pretty similar to um, what you have described. In other words, the UK will typically not enforce uh, foreign export control rules. However, if um, the claimant can show that the item was stolen, uh, for example, its ownership vested in a, in a foreign country or in a foreign state, then the English courts will enforce that those ownership rights. So otherwise in the UK, just you declare it, you pay that, and that's it. That's it. Right. Correct. All right, so we got we're getting to the meat. So what what has changed in the EU? Um, and I know this is the date of adoption of the law is different from the full implementation date. So there's some process here, right? But what is what's coming? Okay, so it, it really started with a political decision around 2015 that the EU should be seen um, to fight against the financing of terrorism and money laundering. And, and quite quickly, the trade in cultural goods was raised as an issue in relation to terrorism and money laundering. Um, this led to the adoption in 2019 of a regulation, an EU regulation, on the introduction and the import of cultural goods. And that's the legislative instrument that um, is the foundation, if you like, of this new EU importation, import control uh, regime for cultural goods. Hmm. All right, so what what is changing then in the EU? Well, for the first time, um, in order to introduce or to import certain types of cultural property uh, in the EU, you will have to obtain either an import license uh, for the cultural goods that are considered to be high risk, or rather, you will have to sign what they call an importer declaration for other types of cultural goods that are considered to be less of a risk. Okay, and what is a high risk piece of cultural property? How is that defined in the regulations? Okay, so the regulation has at the end an annex, which is in three parts. And the goods that will require an import license are covered by Part B of that annex. Essentially, they are in two, well, three main categories, I would say. The first category are the products of archaeological excavations on land or underwater. Uh, the second category are elements of monuments and sites. And the third category, religious icons and statues. Now, if you decide to import into the EU objects in one of those three categories, you will only in, uh, require an import license if the item in question is more than 250 years old. So forget things that are made recently, 20th century, even 19th century. Um, we're not concerned about that. We're concerned about ancient artworks. The right. value, and, the and value just, however, ma matters not. So uh, they can be worth $10, a million dollars. You will need an import license. Right. And are these only objects that were made or created outside of the EU at one point 
or does it also apply to objects that were created within what is now the European Union? But then left and came back. Right. right. No, you're right. This only applies to objects that were created or discovered outside the EU. Right. So Roman sculptures, Greek sculptures, old master paintings, German silver, all of that is not within the scope of this regulation. Right. As long as the Roman statues were created in modern day in Italy, modern day Italy or, or within the what's or now you, yeah. the European Union. But presumably if the Roman Empire was broader than that and the works were created elsewhere, they would still be subject to this regulation. Is that right? Very good point. You're, Absolutely. you're getting to a <laughs> key problem here. Yeah, All right. no, and that's one of the issues we are having with this um, with this regulation, which assumes that the ancient world was made of nations with boundaries similar to, to national boundaries, similar to those we know today, which of course is, as we know, not the case. Yeah. So to identify whether a particular object was created, discovered in the European Union can in itself be a headache. So just to back up, so the, the regulation itself doesn't say only if this is an antiquity that's more than 250 years old or there's other categories we'll get to. The, the regulation just says you cannot import property created outside of the EU if it was exported from any country illegally, right? That's that's the regulation. It's not only if it's worth this much or if it's this old. It's just you can't, it doesn't matter if it's five years old or 5,000 years old or $5 or $5 million. It's just you can no longer import cultural objects if they were exported illegally, period, right? And then what we're talking about now is the extra regulatory requirements, administrative requirements for especially sensitive objects. That's right. Okay. So there is this general prohibition you can't introduce in the territory of the European Union cultural property removed from the territory of other countries, well, countries outside the EU, uh, if the cultural property was illegally exported from, from that country. And if you do, there will be criminal sanctions. Right. Um, now, that raises all sorts of questions which we can come to. And one of those questions is, what do we mean by cultural property subject to this general prohibition? Uh, in order to find the answer, you've got to look at part A of the regulation, which basically adopts the definitions of cultural property you find in the UNESCO Convention of 1970. It's a long list of almost all types of cultural property, irrespective of value for two categories of property at the minimum ages of 100 years old. That's for antiquities, which, you know, antiquities almost by definition are always more than 100 years old, and furniture. And for two categories, um, the item must be old, books and musical instrument. What old means is a matter of interpretation. For our listeners' purposes, for our purposes, every fine art object is going to fall into this regulation. Correct. Yeah. Uh, fine art, antiques, and collectible items. Right. Okay, so we have this general prohibition, which, which, as we've said, is a shift in that it is the EU saying we are going to enforce other countries' export laws. Right? We're not just worried about ownership. We're going to enforce export laws, and we're going to make that enforcement subject to criminal liability. So I think that's significant. I don't, but it, it gets even crazier. Right. So. <laughs> because because if, if I'm someone who is in possession of a piece of cultural property that falls under the regulation, I live in the United States, and I want to uh, move to France, I want to take it with me, what do I now have to do or what will I have to do uh, in order to comply with the new regulations? Do I have to fill out some forms? Do I have to sign things, get papers? What, what? It depends. Okay. That's right. It depends. It depends on what it is that you want to import in the EU. If it's a Part B, 
uh, type cultural goods, i.e. what they call high risk. And as I've said, high risk is the product of archaeological excavations on land or underwater, elements of monuments or sites, and uh, religious icons or statues. They are considered high risk, irrespective of their value. If they're more than 250 years old, you will need to obtain an import license in order to be able to import the item in the EU. And what do you need to do to get the import license? Well, that's a very good question. You will need to apply for the license. The application will need to be filed with the customs authority in the country of importation. Um, the application would need to be accompanied by documentation showing that the item of cultural property was lawfully exported from the country in which it was created or discovered. Okay, so this is, it's a worthy goal, right? We we want to know that property, stolen property is not being imported, that antiquities, religious objects, stuff from ancient monuments, this is just the kind of thing that is more likely to be looted or more likely to be um, subject to a country's patrimony laws. So there's, there is heightened sensitivity around these objects and there has been much looting of them. But the problem with this regime, as you just described it, Pierre, addressing that problem is that it's asking for documentation that nobody has. So I'm curious or what never you, existed. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, may, may never have existed. And if it did exist, was not required at the time when people would have saved it. And so I'm curious, Pierre, like, what do you think about we'll get to category B, which is the middle category of restriction in a minute where the as you said, the we don't need an advance import license, but you do need to declare that it was exported at all times legally, which raises the same problem. It's either you don't have the documentation or you're signing your name to something as an owner that you can't possibly know anything about. So it's a tricky situation, and I'm not sure how it plays out. So, so you're right. I mean, on paper, it looks great, and nobody can object to the intention behind the need for, but the need to show that uh, the item was exported lawfully. The problem is the evidence is is simply impossible to adduce. Um, the first question is how do uh, do you identify the country where the object was created or discovered? I mean, in some cases it might be obvious, but in many cases it won't be. Take you know Islamic art. Take. Uh, tribal art, mm -hmm. um, pre-Columbian art. This type of object may have been created or discovered in, you know, at least half a dozen countries, if not more. This so is actually a, a profound point that I think we certainly haven't made enough on the podcast. And I think in discussions about cultural property and looting and ownership really isn't emphasized enough, which is that our modern conceptions of identity and culture and defined by nation state borders has something, but sometimes little to do with prior understandings of how cultures aligned and connected and who created and owned certain cultural objects. And, and we don't have a great system for going back in time and figuring that out. And so we're, we impose this sort of modern cultural identity, nation state framework on creation that had nothing to do with those boundaries. And I don't have a better idea, but the more you think about it, the odder it is that we sort of give the winners of whatever sort of expansion and wars and changing nation states, right? We give the sort of cultural and political winners of that, you know, centuries long back and forth the right to own these objects. And it doesn't always make sense. Yeah, and I'll give you an example. I mean, you mentioned the Roman Empire. Um, I think that's a very good example. And um, some listeners will be familiar with the Cefso treasure, um, which um, uh, came to market uh, in the late 80s from memory um, and was very controversial. And that treasure was claimed by three countries as different as Hungary, Serbia, 
and the Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. That's because the Roman Empire was so huge that this Roman treasure could have been discovered in one of those three countries. Right. Right. And then you have the, the secondary problem after you've identified those three or four countries is we're probably talking about a period of time where there were no export regulations. That's a relatively more yeah, recent Yeah, and it wouldn't even thing. have to be that long ago. For no, right. Country. I mean, we've had situations even in the art world where, where works of art, European art, were acquired over 100 years ago. And, and now, of course, you always have to, uh, in selling it, have to sort of affirm that it was not taken out of a country in violation of uh, an export law. But there wasn't an export law at that time. So it's there's that complication as well. Yeah, I mean, this is, right, exactly. There's these two problems. There's the conceptual problem of, and the historic research problem of what is the source country, right? Where did this come from? And as we just described, that itself can be extremely difficult to figure out. And experts disagree on that question when given all the evidence, right? So that's a fundamental problem. And then secondly, even if everyone did agree on the original source country, however long ago that that was, there is likely zero documentation about its provenance travels out of that source country, including when it happened, you know, how it happened, who was the exporter. So this isn't just a, this could be a problem. This is a problem for almost every item like this. That's right. Yeah, with and, a crim and, criminal consequence. That's with criminal consequences. Yeah, and in order to decide whether there were export control rules at the time of the removal of the object from the country, you've got to figure out when it was removed. And then if you find out when it was removed, there's sometimes a little bit of um, what I call legal archaeology that needs to be carried out to figure out at that time what export control rules apply. And from experience, that can be tricky. And then you know, let's assume you know when the item was removed. Let's assume you have identified which export control rule would have applied. Um, and let's assume that that particular object needed an export license. In 99.9% .9 of cases, that document will not be available. And it would be wrong to conclude from the absence of the document that the item was illegally exported. No one knows. It's just that at the time, and even today, you know, most uh, collectors don't bother asking their shipper for a copy of the export um, papers. They lie on dusty bookshelves uh, in, in shipping companies or on old computers. And until now, at least, nobody really has paid attention. Yeah, they've ne they, well, they were never required. So there was nothing nefarious. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an extremely problematic regulation for any of these antiquities, you know, ancient objects categories, because I, I really don't see how it can be complied with. And I guess the only good thing about this category versus the low risk category, which we'll talk more about in a minute, where you just need to make a declaration, is that the EU states will see pretty quickly that this documentation is not available, right? So unlike waiting for someone to make a false declaration and then a third party coming in and saying, no, we own it, and then there being some litigation or state investigation, here, I guess the import officials of each EU country are going to see these applications and see pretty quickly, I'm guessing, that there are no documents. And I'm just wondering if that will sort of force a, I don't know, a reconsideration? Well, it's really interesting you should say that because it's very clear that the EU legislator did figure out that this documentation would not be available. Mm. And instead of saying, okay, well, uh, what we suggested clearly doesn't work, so let's scrap that and start again. Um, they hang on to that, they said, no, 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 we know that that documentation is not available generally, but we'll keep the rule. And there will be an exemption or a couple of exemptions if either the country where the object was discovered or created cannot be established, 
or you can show you importer can show that the cultural object was taken out of the country of, or of origin before 24 April 1972. Now, if either of those assumptions is correct, then the exemption says that you, the importer, in order to get your import license, can provide evidence of lawful export from the last country in which the object was located for at least five years. Okay, so that's, that is a significant Yeah, but that's, exception. it's really extraordinary because effectively the EU is giving us a recipe to launder <laughs> um, <say> antiquities, <laughs> um, they are saying, okay, we accept that what we are asking for is impossible. So here's the trick. You park um, the item in a country where there are no export control rules or they're pretty lax. You leave it there for five years. You present it to us for an import license. We'll give you an import license. And once the object has an EU import license, it probably would be considered to be pretty safe. And then it can so, move around. Yeah. Yeah, and it can move around. So it's it's effectively a recipe for laundering um, <laughs> cultural property, which I think is, is absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, that, that is extraordinary. And does that five-year period apply only to the sort of two other exception categories that you mentioned that you can't identify uh, where the country of origin was and that it left wherever it was found prior to 1972. Do those two things have to exist? And then if those exist, you can park the item for five years in a country and then eventually after five years move it to the EU. And that applies to category B and C risk objects, meaning it applies to high risk objects and low risk objects in terms of getting out of your requirement to get the advance import license with all that documentation and make a declaration that you know about the entire export history of an object. Correct. Correct. So you, you can see what will happen. Um, in order to benefit from the exemption, people will be tempted either to remove any sign of where the object might have come from, its country of origin, so that one can claim, oh, it, we can't establish where it came from and therefore the exemption is available. So that's really making very important and relevant evidence um, unavailable. Or you will find probably in auction catalogues uh, in the provenance, objects in country X since 1973 or 1974, again, as a way to benefit from this exemption. I do want to talk a little about the category C. So there's this, there's sort of what we'll call category A, which is the general rule, which is, there doesn't apply to any specific, you know, regulatory administrative steps. It's just no, no importing objects cultural goods of any kind that were exported illegally anywhere. Then we talked about the high risk category. And then there's this low risk category two Pierre, which is we call the part C objects. And and those are in a way seems like it should be easier, but to me the requirement is actually scarier because you're saying, I'm not gonna give you the state documentation so that you're satisfied of the legality of the import. I'm putting myself on the line as the importer to sign a declaration that I'm 100% attesting that I know and promise that it was legally exported at every point in its history, and that's required. I think almost nobody who signs a declaration like that will actually be able to honestly attest to that for the reasons we talked about. They just They will not have the paperwork, right? So what... What is th That's a significant problem because the regulation makes it clear that in order for you to sign the um, importer declaration, you have to have the documentation. It's just that for lower value items, you don't have to volunteer that documentation, but the regulation makes it clear that on request, you must provide it. It doesn't seem like much lower risk. <laughs> 
I mean, that's it's not a not lot. Much. No. <laughs> well, and we should say these are not, these aren't your everyday objects. This is still objects that are older than 200 years and worth more than 18,000 18, euros, right? So there, this is still a, a category of old, important stuff of some value. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Imagine you have a, a collection of, um, I don't know, original prints by famous artists. Um, they are all more than 200 years old and, and worth more than 18,000 euros apiece. In order to import that collection into the EU, you've got to sign the uh, importer declaration and you're supposed to have export license from the country of origin. Right. So you have to attest that you actually have it. Uh, is that yes. that this seems is, crazy? It's, like, well, I mean, people will just no one will sign this or everyone will lie and it won't be enforced or this regulation will really fall completely to its exceptions. Right. That these sort of basic rules or, you know, main rules won't matter at all because no one will ever be able to comply with them. And so the two derogations will be the rule in themselves. Yeah, yeah. But that means that you will have to park a cultural property that falls within one of these um, uh, categories. You have to park it somewhere for five years, or you'll have to be able to show that it was parked for five years somewhere. Right. And, right. and if you parked it and then exported it from that country after five years, then of course you, it, it's within your control to get the export license. But if somebody else parked it, uh, you may not be able to get your hands on the export license, in which case mm. you have to wait another five years um, uh, with the, the item parked in, a, in yet another country before you can import it into the EU. It's, it's a crazy system. And just to remind people, this is not about whether the objects are stolen, right? There's a separate regime if you're importing either stolen, as Steve said, in the traditional sense, or stolen because a country's patrimony laws give it ownership of the object and deem it stolen property, right? There's a whole separate regime making that illegal. So that this is not implicating that. This is an additional requirement, even assuming that that criminal liability for stolen property isn't at play. That's right. And that's, I think, what important to remember, because mm. it's a much more profound problem with your you know, I was going to say normal people, but right. normal people, maybe not normal people, but your normal collector, right, who's, let's say, moving from from New York to Paris or was relocating for a job and would like to bring their art collection yeah. with them, or you literally can't move with right. your own Even stuff. Even if it's not commercially motivated, because it, that's not really relevant, not is relevant. whether or not you're bringing it there to sell or, or traveling with it to, to live with. So let's talk more about the practical implications of this. I think, you know, there, as we just discussed, there are ways to get around these rules, but they are costly and they take time. So I don't know, it's kind of an interesting answer to say, oh, sure, you can move with your own stuff, but not for five or more years while you figure out how to deal with this exception. First, this seems incredibly expensive, right? So, so true normal people, how they're going to navigate this is beyond me. I think they won't. For a lot of the non-category B or C objects, they're just going to move them, right? They're just going to be moved, and it's going to be a question of whether there's enforcement or anyone cares about lower value, not old objects coming in that don't have this proof. But... You know, I think the expense for certainly for not the wealthiest art dealers or collectors who are, you know, don't have exceptional wealth or, you know, don't have this expertise lined right. up, it can be quite onerous. Also, if, if I mean, it's one thing if you can imagine somebody with uh, a very valuable object that falls into this category uh, who wants to sell it. Right. Uh, th they'll, they'll be able to hire a lawyer. This is part of the cost of the transaction. This is part of the cost of the transaction. And if it's worth enough, then it'll be worth, you know, doing the things that you need to do. But if you're just, again, if there's no commercial objective and you're just, just moving something from point A to point B and you have to pay thousands of dollars to do it, then 
that's going to be a problem. Yeah. So I think there's like the individual family person problem, right, Pierre? Just that people literally won't be able to move their own stuff. That's right. So if you move to, in order to sell it, um, you know, you will have a huge incentive to sell in, in New York or London where these rules don't apply. Now, there is an exemption for art fairs. So um, ah. in, in order to show uh, cultural property at an art fair, well, I say there is an exemption. I mean, you, the importer still have to sign or has to sign the importer declaration, but doesn't have to produce, it doesn't need an import license, even if it's an antiquity or a religious icon or statue, in other words, a part B type item. But they would still so have to Durant sign some... out, Yeah, as Durant pointed out, because you still need to sign the importer declaration. If you don't have the documentation, you probably shouldn't sign it. Mm -hmm. um, and the risk if you sign it and you bring it, uh, say, to Maastricht, you sell it in Maastricht to an, an EU buyer, at that point, you will need, you or the buyer will need an import license. And if the documentation is not available, then it's even worse because you are worse because the risk is that the item could be seized and confiscated. Right. So that was the second sort of category of practical problems we were going to raise. So you have the individual problem, which is that a person that owns a collection cannot move with it if they are moving. And then there's the commercial problem, which, as you said, Pierre, is, in my mind, does this gut the auction market for these for objects not created in the EU in continental Europe? I mean, how can an auction house function in Paris when they have to deal with this regulation for every single consignment? I guess unless they only are going to have EU consigners who are consigning goods that are already in the EU. and But that really shrinks the power of those sales, right? It's not, they're not going to be blockbuster sales or right. you can't and predict. You could, have, you could have also U.S., um, you know, items from the U.S. Since, since we don't have export rules relating to most that things. were created in the u.s right if they were created in the u.s then presumably it would be easy to comply with you know the law because there's no you'd way. have to you'd have to comply but it would not be as risky it, it would be yeah. much easier um yeah. and so either created in the u.s or you can show that they have been in the u.s for more than five years yeah, yeah. and i would think even i mean just think about conceptually while it could have an impact, a, a more severe impact on auction houses, say, in Paris, um, even if you think about a, an auction of these kinds of objects, even in the UK, if it would, it would have an impact on buyers right. who were located in the EU. So you, I mean, it's not like you could just go to London, buy something at the London auction. You right. still would have a problem bringing it back home. So it would eliminate not just a, a venue for an auction, but also a category of buyers who just, unless they have a place in London, you know. That's really true. And as we said, you know, the beginning, the art market is so global. So the same high net worth collectors are going around the world to see the same types of sales. And they're not limited by where they live. So that really, I think... I don't know, Pierre, does it choke the auction market in in Europe and sort of redistribute those high value, a lot of the high value sales to, as you said, New York or London or Hong Kong? Well, I think as a seller, you definitely will not want to go through this bureaucratic nightmare in order to sell in, in Paris or, or in Germany. There will be an incentive in selling in London or New York. And Steve, you are quite right. Your EU buyers will not have an incentive to buy these objects outside the EU because if they do and they want to bring it into the EU, they'll have to go through this nightmare. I suspect that the, the Swiss free ports, for example, could end up uh, benefiting from this new legislation because some collectors, you know, French or German, say, uh, buy in London and New York, and then they store things for five years in a free port in Switzerland, then they move it to the EU, and out of Switzerland, 
well, that should be quite easy, um, provided they can show that the country of origin is unknown or it was out of the country of origin since 1972. Right. right. But it also, I mean, what you're saying presumes a certain type of collector yeah. who is willing to buy uh, an object and put it in a free port for five years. And and also have the staff and the, ex, you know, the the lawyers and the accountants and, and to make that happen. It's, it's a, right. I mean, this is a problem in the art world in general, but this is just almost a further consolidation of elite collectors into the only people that can really participate freely in this market. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. So it's the buyers are disincentivized, the sellers are disincentivized because they can't move it in or out, or they don't want to deal with the, the admin. And then I think these European businesses, as I said before, are, are really like caught in the crosshairs of that. And I wonder if that was a concern in implementing these regulations, Pierre, that European auction houses, but also smaller dealers who might sell these types of objects could be severely impacted by these regulations. And also culturally that, you know, these EU countries would accept that they're going to lose their commercial artistic sector to some degree. That's right. I mean, if you look at the tribal art market, it's very much based in Paris and Brussels. Hmm. How will these dealers thrive once these regulation uh, this regulation is um, coming into force? I, I I really don't know because their market will suddenly shrink to just the EU market, both for sellers and for buyers. I would argue, well, certainly for sellers, maybe not so much for buyers because if you are from the US and you buy in Paris, well, that's not the end of the world because you can mer- that take it out. Yeah, not apply. But still, you know, in North, in terms of getting the stock, they will have a severe, there will be a severe obstacle in their way. Mm. Right. And so let's talk a little bit about when, when these go into effect, because we've been talking about them. They were enacted, I guess, initially in 2019, but something... Uh, they're is, not in effect, right? They're not. There's, explain how it's going to happen. Yeah, so the general prohibition uh, to importing uh, cultural property that's been illegally exported, that's already in force. But if you want to import a collection or an an object right now in the EU, you don't need an import license or you don't need to support or or an importer statement. that will only come into force, we expect, at the end of June 2025. So there is, a, say, an 18 month window of opportunity to get your collection through the EU door before this uh, regulation comes it's into th- force. So theoretically, it's, it, it may not be permitted. But you don't have to sign But your you don't have to anything. sign anything. You don't have to have any documents. So you can just... Just ignore it, uh, I guess, if if you want, and bring whatever you want into the EU, and um, and then there's also I understand some some form of data sharing or database that's going to go along with this. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit, Pierre? Sure. So the significance of the end of June 2025 is the date when the European Commission expect to release a database that will allow uh, customs, uh, the customs authorities of the member states to log in documentation and exchange information that will allow them to effectively enforce this regulation. So things like items that are temporarily imported uh, into the EU via France well, every, all customs authorities across the EU will be able to check that that item carries an EU import um, license. If uh, the Spanish authority rejects an object by refusing to grant an import license, the customs authorities of other all the other member states will know that. So if the importer, having failed in Spain, tries in Austria, um, the Austrians will 
um, be able to say, no, you, you can't get it in because <laughs> you were refused an import license by the Spanish. So this might, might cause also a little bit of shopping around in terms of where you choose your, your point, of, point entry. of entry. Because I assume, mm -hmm. even though we do have a European Union and the regulation is EU-wide, we're still actually, you're still importing works physically into a particular country, and each of those countries has their own customs officers and regimes and, and sort of ways of doing business. And so they're it's conceivable that individuals might try to pinpoint the the less stringent entry points, I guess, if you will. That's right. I mean, the issue there, of course, is that the less stringent entry point might be uh, countries that have the highest rate of import VAT. Ah. So yeah. it's a question of <laughs> yeah. deciding <laughs> yeah. what's your priority. Well, that's kind of an interesting I think point. that will happen, yeah, right, because right. those countries will smartly decide to make it easy yeah. so they can collect the e e Easy and, um, and valuable for them. That's so, we, so, yeah, of course, we've been speculating wildly, which we do like to do, uh, about what will happen. But we, I guess we will, we will see how this implementation works in the next few years. Pierre, do you have a sense to speculate further about the enforcement capacity for these regulations? I'm just wondering, I mean, every law and regulation is only as good as how serious people take the possibility of getting in trouble. Um, I mean, it, what what is the enforcement mechanism and capacity for giving real teeth to these regulations? Well, it's a very good question. I think the EU Commission has wildly underestimated the burden that these, this regulation will place on the customs authorities oh, well, yeah. in, in the member states, because how many, how many customs officers are trained to understand, you know, how, how to apply this regulation? I mean, they will have to figure out what an export license from Colombia, Papua New Guinea and, and China look like when presented with one. Um, there is an obligation on the importer, by the way, to produce or to provide customs with an official translation. Okay. Um, so that's added uh, an added cost. That burden falls on the importer, not on the customs authority. But still, the customs authority will have to figure out what the documentation is about and whether the documentation satisfies the uh, requirements of this uh, regulation. That will require a lot of training, in my opinion, um, more staff, and I, I just don't know how they will manage. Right, and so you said reasonable people can disagree about some of this, the history in this documentation, right. and so we're asking un, untrained, I mean, trained for what they do, but not trained in the art world, customs officers to interpret potentially very old, confusing paperwork that, you know, the highest paid lawyers in litigation disagree about right. for years and, and years. And art historians yeah. and anthropologists. I mean, and clearly, you know, it's the same. It's it's a little bit like the problem that we have encountered in here and in London, you know, where the uh, importation of artwork is not subject to duty generally, but objects of utility are. And so you're in some cases asking customs officers uh, to make judgments as to whether artwork which isn't conventional. Like light bulbs. Like light bulbs. Um, and, and and even a Brancusi, in, yeah. in our case, years ago, that are, are not really within their realm of expertise. And you can just sort of imagine how this will play out um, in, in that sort of context. It's, it's pretty crazy. Absolutely. Okay. And I, I suspect, you know, I'm speculating again, that some customs officer won't understand a thing about about this and will simply stamp whatever is presented to them and off you go. And then there will be the the zealous um, customs officers who won't understand, but that means <laughs> they won't issue the right. import license or they will, you know, not accept the importer statement. And that will lead to a lot of frustration and probably uh, more work for lawyers. Right. And this was a sexy topic, as it turns out. Oh, I have 
There's so many questions. No <laughs> answers and so many questions. <laughs> All right. This is how we like to leave things. Well, thank you, Pierre. This was really uh, enjoyable. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it too. And that's it for today's podcast. Please subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and send us feedback at podcast at schlaw.com. And if you like what you hear, give us a five-star rating. We are also featuring the original music of Chris Thompson. And finally, we want to thank our fabulous producer, Jackie Santos, for making us sound so good. Until next time, I'm Katie Wilson-Milney. And I'm Steve Schindler, bringing you the Art Law Podcast, a podcast exploring the places where art intersects with and interferes with the law. The information provided in this podcast is not intended to be a source of legal advice. You should not consider the information provided to be an invitation for an attorney-client relationship, should not rely on the information as legal advice for any purpose, and should always seek the legal advice of competent counsel in the relevant jurisdiction.